Happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to a special episode of Insights from the Caribbean Congress on Adolescent and Youth Health, live from Kingston, Jamaica. Of course, this is where the Youth Congress is being held. And under the theme, building, sorry, under a special theme, building a back better, advancing and safeguarding the health and well being of adolescents and youth in the Caribbean. PAHO and its partners are making a special effort to engage youth from all backgrounds with one common goal, to improve the health of adolescent and youth within the region. Good afternoon, my name is Tanya McFall Major from the PAHO Bahamas office, and we have a special panel today, and we'll have them introduce themselves. So we'll begin with Dr. Claudina Cayetano from PAHO. Dr. Cayetano, please introduce yourself to our members. Good afternoon. Hi, Miss Tania. So good to be part of this uh, panel. I'm uh, Claudina Cayetano. I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist, and I work with PAHO as an advisor in mental health, uh, based in Washington and currently attending the Congress in Jamaica. It's a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Cayetano. Thank you. And we also want to welcome at this time, Jessica Anthony. Jessica? Hi, good good afternoon, everybody. So I am Jessica, Jessica Anthony. I am from Guyana. Um, I'm a recent graduate of the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, I have a master's in global health. Um, so I worked along with the organizing committee to help organize the conference. Um, I'm also here as a participant and a presenter. I'll be presenting in the mental health track of the conference. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Dr. Cayetano, for being here today. We're excited to hear and to learn from each other. And of course, we want to encourage our audience to share the, the stream, um, share the information on Facebook, on YouTube. For persons who may need to know this information, this is the opportunity to help those uh, as we uh, as help ourselves. So we have a few questions and we want to get started with Dr. Cayetano. So this Congress has brought together several organizations to discuss the health challenges that adolescents and youth face in the region. Why is it important to focus on mental health? Thank you, Ms. Tania. You are quite right, correct in terms of, um, you know, there's so many other topics that are extremely relevant for adolescents, you know, uh, but the topic of mental health, particularly important, precisely because of the changes, the challenges and that they have been facing. Specifically, as you know, during the pandemic, it was not easy. And uh, one of the population that was affected uh, is the youth and adolescent. I mm -hmm. think at the beginning we were we, tend, we were thinking that you know people with um, underlying conditions, chronic disorders, and then we we forgot the importance of focusing on adolescent and youth. And uh, you know when the restrictions started to become more clear, uh, not going to school and uh, not socializing, not being able to see their friends, uh, that has a huge toll on the, on, on adolescent and staying home. And uh, it, there is so many uh, challenges that they had to face. And mm -hmm. so it becomes so important that we focus on, on their mental well-being. And when we say mental health, as you know, we're talking about the mental well-being. We're talking about staying healthy, staying well, because that's what helps them to be able to, uh, you know, go through their life uh, or, you know, face their life uh, child demands. So definitely it's a, it's a topic that this Congress has taken very seriously. And we're very happy from PAHO that colleagues who have uh, organizations who have joined also realize the importance of focusing on mental health. Thank you so much, Dr. Cayetano. Jessica, do you want to add? Um, yes. So, well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, I'm really happy to be here in Jamaica at the second Caribbean Congress on Adolescent and Youth Health. You know, it's been a really valuable and enriching experience so far to be in the presence of so many inspiring people, inspiring leaders and vibrant, passionate young people from across the entire Caribbean region. And we even have some participants from Latin America as well. Um, one thing that I have noticed is that, you know, I was a participant in the 2019 Congress as well. And to add, you know, to what Dr. Cayetano said about COVID having amplified some of these uh, problems that we face with mental health. Um, 
you know, I was in participating in the mental health track in 2019. And what I can say from my experience having been at both Congresses is that this time around, after we've all gone through this shared experience of the COVID-19 pandemic, experiencing lockdowns, not being able to go to school, not being able to go to work, no matter mm -hmm. where we were in the region or in the world, more of our participants this year have recognized the importance of mental health. More people are paying attention to it. Mental health conversations are at the forefront of our discussions here at the Congress. And I think generally more people are talking about it as well. I'm really happy to see this. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna say, you know, if there is one good thing that COVID-19 has probably done for us is that it, it highlighted the whole concept of, you know, there is no health without mental health. Dr. Cayetano said that in one of her <laughs> sessions yesterday. So I'm just bringing it back to that. <laughs> Well, thank you for that, Jessica. And we know that Dr. Cayetano is definitely a uh, proponent of mental health. And I know that she recently led one of the PAHO mental health campaigns that was shown throughout the region. Um, here in the Bahamas, we've had great responses with that as well. And so thinking about, um, oh, thank you, <laughs> and thinking about mental health and we think about the environment, is there a connection between the two? Yes, there is a connection between the two. And you know, one of the things that in the presentation it also became clear, uh, one, that you know there is no health without mental health, as Jessica was saying that we mentioned it yesterday, but then, and the other speakers were also bringing that the important that mental health is everybody business, it's all our business. We need to pay attention to mental health. But importantly, it's particularly now, because you know, think about before COVID, and now we're going to go beyond COVID, Mental health has to continue to be a conversation. And I'm really glad that adolescents and youth are embracing this opportunity. Because as you know, the challenges before, you know, when it comes to investment in mental health, when it comes to prioritizing mental health, when, when it comes to having policies and having, um, you know, having programs and having interventions at the community level uh that's very limited and mm -hmm. exactly what you said in terms of why we have to be uh, engaging in the campaign because as you know one of these to me greatest uh public health uh, barrier to to mental health to accessing services is a stigma stigma and discrimination so right. therefore it becomes very important that we engage in uh, in the discussion, in the conversation, to promote mental health and to decrease the stigma, so that persons can feel comfortable to seek help, to ask for, you know, to uh, ask for um, if they need help, if they need attention, and not to be not to feel ashamed that mm -hmm. they need to do that. That's nothing to do with that. On the contrary, it's a strength when you can ask for help because it's it's going to help you and help your family and make you become more uh, you know comfortable in your thoughts in your performance so yeah. we this conversation is definitely very important uh, and i'm so happy to see that i think we have we were so told about almost 300 persons that have joined this conference this is fantastic for the caribbean i think it's a uh, jessica you probably i was at the 2019 in trinidad in puerto spain uh, but i think there is, we have a lot more now that have joined this conference and so it's good to know that the conversation is is, is on the table that you know we're we're placing mental health on the agenda Definitely. And that's something I'm adding to what Jessica mentioned earlier. I think as a result of COVID-19, we're having the conversation more about mental health because of like you talked about the stigma and discrimination, you know, there were, it, it was unfair to persons. And now people are finding and they're realizing certain attitudes or behaviors they were exhibiting all of a sudden. And it's, not completely their fault is because they're going through different things. I see you shaking your head, Jessica, jump right in. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. So, you know, a, a benefit of more people paying attention to mental health and probably becoming, you know, more attuned to their own mental health is that I think we are having, as you said, we're having these conversations more 
And as a spin-off to having these conversations more and to people becoming more attuned to their own mental health Mm -hmm. is that people are learning more and more that, you know, we need to talk about this. We need to figure out, okay, how can I help myself? How can I help other people? How can I support my friends? How can I support my family? You know, um, other people in my community, people, you know, students, your employees, whoever you're interacting with at some point, you know, maybe you might want to help somebody and having these conversations and having mental health conversations become more normal is really beneficial to that. Talking about it is one of the very first steps in what we all need to learn how to do. Um, That will really help us with removing the stigma, having open conversations about mental health. I know that, you know, especially in the Caribbean, this is culturally a very difficult thing to do. It has really been an uphill battle. But what I can say is over the last few years, um, I'm encouraged to see that more persons, especially young people, are speaking openly about their mental health. They are speaking about their struggles. They are speaking about, you know, their experiences. And this is this is really good because I think um, a really important thing that we all need to do is collectively recognize, reflect, take action to address, you know, the mental health related stigma and even discrimination. That is so true, Dr. Cayetano. Yes. Um... One she's of the smiling. Things. She's so excited about what you <laughs> oh, said. I'm extremely happy. Yeah, <laughs> this is music to me with my ears. You know, because not only because uh, there is also research, as you know, the research. Fortunately, there was research that was done to be able to show the impact of, uh, you know, the COVID, the pandemic on adolescents. So mm-hmm. anxiety, people suffering more from anxiety, people suffering more from depression. And these are um, disorders that if not, if, if they are untreated, they can have serious consequences to the individual. You know, people can start to go into more... Um, negative coping behaviors, let's say like drinking and using more uh, substances, or they can actually also start to have more um, negative thoughts, like think about self-harm and all of those things. So when there is, ans- there is if, if it's a- addressed early and uh, quickly, they can be treated. So we know that research has shown the increase in, su- in, um, in the, in, anxiety and in depression and some people also having a, a disorder like that but you know having problems to sleep having feeling neg- feeling negative uh becoming it's becoming isolating themselves and all of those things affect their well-being mm-hmm. uh, and i think this is it is research has shown that and not only for the youth but even for uh first responders uh healthcare providers uh, caregivers, people at home, you know, those things can be very important. So I am so glad to see that there, we have paying, we are paying attention to that. But then there is also the challenge when it comes to uh, the human resources that are available to address the problems, the financing, the funding that we allocate to mental health, um, the presence of um, policies and legislation to be able to protect people you know, so I, I think this this conversation, especially with the youth, I was very pleased that um, the youth were saying, you know, calling for action, making sure that last last conference, the first conference, they develop a roadmap, and this conference there is a call to action, so that their mm-hmm. government can actually place more emphasis on you know investing on mental health. And I want to say thank you again to our panel and for those that are just tuning in. You're watching the insights of the second Congress on adolescent and youth health in the Caribbean. And we're excited to have Dr. Claudina Cayetano and also Jessica, Ms. Jessica Anthony here today. And we're talking about mental health and other insights from the, the, the regional Congress. And it's really exciting, as you said, to hear that there was a roadmap. Now our youth are talking about a call to action. But what sometimes I've also realized, of course, that is great, but I've realized that sometimes persons are unable to recognize the symptoms in themselves. So how do we help to bring attention to that? I know you talked about anxiety, depression, but are there any other symptoms that may not be as visible, but can be uh, connected to mental health issues? 
Yes, definitely they are. Because, you know, what do we want? People know themselves. You know yourself. You know how you're functioning. And uh, But the issue, and Jessica also was mentioning that, is that if you're not comfortable to talk about that, you will hide. You will pretend. You will smile as if everything is, is okay. Because remember, we talking when we talk about mental well-being, we're talking about your thoughts, your feeling, and your behavior. What people can see, people see your behavior. People mm -hmm. may see your feelings if you're smiling, and you know, but you, that could be just that you're pretending. That doesn't mean that you actually are expressing, uh, showing the sadness or that you're experiencing. But mm -hmm. your thoughts can be negative thoughts. So you have poor concentration. You may not be, people may not be sleeping well. So they may not be sleeping well. They may have been problems to eat with their appetite, eating too much or eating too little or not eating, you know, not taking care of themselves. They may have their energy poor energy, um, they're not having something we call like lack of pleasure, not enjoying themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And becoming more mis irritable, more moody, and, and people can see that. So even your performance at work can become, because there's something we call presentism, you go to work, but you're not actually there, right? So mm -hmm. you're just, your body is there, but your mind is not there because you know, you're not concentrating, your motivation is very low. So people can see these things, and may they may ignore that. You can also know these things and you may ignore that. And it's not that you're ignoring it, it's because if you don't have the literacy, if you don't know what it's like that you should be looking for and how you look after yourself, that becomes an issue. And you know, I'm, I'm so glad you asked me about that, Miss Tanya, because this brings me to an, an important topic that we are actually touching on during the conference, which is the issue of mental health literacy. And that we have, we from PAHO uh, have been promoting the school mental health literacy, which is, uh, you know, targeting teachers. Because mm -hmm. as you know, mental health um, school, the teachers know their students, the teachers get to, to interact more with them, they see them during, you know, longer period of time. And it's very important that the teachers do their job. We know that we want them to be teaching. We don't want them to be diagnosing, but that you need to give them the tools to be able to see or the skills to be able to see when the kids are not doing well. Right. And instead of ignoring that, how do they refer them, what they need to do? So there is something we call the you know, mental, the mental health um, uh, school literacy, which is for teachers to feel, build that literacy in understanding signs and symptoms. So mm -hmm. all of us, well, you know, we need to be, um, that's why I'm saying I'm glad that you asked about that because we need to be able to focus on what it is that making it us, how do you know when things are not going well? What do you need to do? What are those signs and those symptoms? And then who do you go to? To is also important. Another important thing is to know, yes, you know, very access to service. But uh, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure this is this is a conversation that we can say <laughs> here together because it's so important building literacy, definitely, and not only at school but at home with our relatives, uh, you know, with the media. So let me stop here. So Jessica, may you want to add to that conversation? Because it's, it's a conversation that I know is happening in the um, uh, with it in Congress. So it's so good to see that. Well, I'm glad that it's happening in the Congress. Before you 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 chime in, Jessica, I'm glad that it's happening in the Congress. But many of our persons who are participating online aren't in the Congress currently. So this information is helping them and opening minds, providing new perspectives on what it is that, on the key things that we need to do or we can do to help ourselves and help others as we move toward uh, positive coping methods and ensuring our mental health. You can chime right in, Jessica. Um, yeah, so just to add to that, part of my work that I do in Guyana, I am actually working on some suicide research studies, which um, are funded by the NIMH in the U.S. Um, it's a collaboration with Columbia University and the Ministry of Health. So we're doing suicide research studies in Guyana right now. Um, and so I, I'm actually presenting on our work in Guyana tomorrow at the conference um, on a panel in a, in a breakout session with Dr. Cayetano as well. Um, she'll be presenting as well, um, but that's just a side note. So um, <laughs> part of part of the work that that we've been doing is we actually go out and we interview uh, persons who have uh, attempted 
suicide and their family members. And we go into these very in-depth interviews with them. And I mean, I, I myself have done some of these interviews and just very broadly, a lot of persons, they would tell you, you know, oh yeah, you know, they, they've been sleeping a lot and they've been, they've been cha changes in behavior, very irritable, snapping at their children, all kinds of things you would hear from people. But none of this really seems to come across to them as changes in behavior that warrant action, you know, and this all comes back to the concept of literacy and education. Mm -hmm. If we don't recognize the signs of poor mental health or deteriorating mental health, then how do we seek help? And that's why it's such an important conversation. And we really all need to educate ourselves and educate the people around us um, because it, it, it's so very important. I think that's a great point. As you said, if we don't understand, if we have, don't know the know-how or what signs to look for, how are we able to provide the guidance? Go ahead, Dr. Cayetano. I see that you're smiling, so you're ready to chime in. Go right ahead. <laughs> you're muted, Dr. Okay, you're good. Thank, thank you. Thank you. No, I, I think, uh, and it's changing, as you know, it's changing gradually and slowly this investment and um, the work in our region, you know, as you know, suicide is a, is a, is a serious uh, issue, uh, public health issues, not for every country in the Caribbean, but mm -hmm. precisely like um, what Jessica was saying for Guyana, for Suriname, you know, that they still have the uh, highest rate for suicide. So it's so, and suicide is an outcome, right? It's the ultimate thing. So before that people have, may have attempted before, they, they may have been showing some signs when things are not going well. And that's what prevention is. That's what promotion is, you know. How do we do prevention? How do we do promotion? But how do people become comfortable to not be ashamed to ask for assistance? Uh, and this is these are the kind of conversation that we want to be able to engage and that if we could do that at work if we could do it at school so that that's what we mean about you know literacy so building that literacy at work and and at school so i, I like that the conference is focusing because when you also think about mental health you know the, it's it's cross cutting right like it's not just um it, it is not just one area we want to be able to see it as since you're, you know, as you develop, as you grow, your mental health matters. That's what the slogan, you know, mental health is everybody's business. So you want to be able to include mental health in, um, you know, in all these initiatives. And the the other component that I find very, very, um, very interesting in terms of even yesterday when we were having this, the, um, the web, the the official ceremony during the evening and the high level authorities came and almost every single one was talking about mental health. And wow. that was, that was the word is getting out there. The word is there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So the patron for the event is the um, first lady. And, you know, she was on with the importance of mental health, uh, of supporting adolescents, of supporting the youth. Because, and, you know, the world was like, the, the youth is not the, to, it's not the tomorrow, it's now. We need to take actions now. Yeah. We should not be waiting until tomorrow that this is the, the day that when we should be taking action. So I am very pleased to see that um, if the first, Congress develop the roadmap. This Congress is going to take action to see changes when it comes to what it is that needs to happen with the um, with the mental health. And again, we have the we have our stigma campaign. So glad to hear that in the Bahamas you are also uh, part. You are part of the campaign of that. Uh, do you do you share to promote mental health? Definitely. And um, la I think it was one of the last lives we did. I think it was last month. We interviewed two young persons who were doing different things in their community. One focused on one was from Trinidad, and she focused on um, teaching persons how to eat more healthy foods by right, supporting the farmers, and that, and of course, the impact of climate change and environmental changes. And then we had another gentleman who was from Antigua, and his focus was mental health, and he had a primary focus on males in the community. 
And I really thought that was good. That was different because oftentimes, and even as we've done with the Stronger Together, Paho Stronger Together campaign in the past, we've seen where men take on or, or male genders, they take on too much, you know, the machoism, the stereotype, the community stereotypes. So oftentimes they're not as brave or courageous rather to talk about it and because of the shame, the stigma, the discrimination. So how can we continue to, besides of course, getting the word out there, getting the policy makers, how can we encourage persons to say, hey, I am going through this and uh, you can, if I'm overcoming it, you can too. Anyone can jump in. Okay. So, you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's part of the discussion. Look, it's three women here and I'm so happy to be part of this with you. And that's what it's, you tend to see, right? If you go right. to hospitals, healthcare providers, 70% of, of healthcare providers are female. So, and that could be for some men, that could be uh, intimidating or they may not be comfortable mm -hmm. you know, to seek help. So we need to create this space. I think we need to create the space. We need to create the opportunities for men, for male to be able to seek help, to be right. able to, you know, we need to have these spaces where they can be comfortable, to have the time. And even when you have the working hours of the health center, sometimes they are changing now so that they create that space for, mm -hmm. for a male to be, to seek help. And it, you mentioned this, and I, I was in, a, I was explaining that um, when you look at, disorders like suicide, uh, you started to see how male are the ones that complete suicide, right? Right. And when you look at the impact of that, and you see that chronic disorders, you also tend to see male having a higher rate. And when you think of the um, life expectancy, the life expectancy is higher for female than for male. So we started to see the importance of health issue, addressing health issues for male, mm -hmm. why that is relevant. So we need to create that is, the space for them to seek help, to consult, to have the conversation, to reduce so that the stigma, we reduce that the stigma and the discrimination so they can do consultations very early on. But I, 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 this, is a, this is a good thing that we are touching, especially for the, for the Caribbean. I think this right. is something extremely, extremely relevant. So having these policies, having these interventions where male can feel comfortable to seek help rather than waiting on, you know, and when you think even for substance use, think substance use is much higher among male than among female. That you know? I, I, and so you, st you start to see that maybe it could be because of coping. They use it as a coping style, you know, they use okay. it as boredom or hiding or something. So all of those things you start to see more greater with, with, with men than we see with women. So this is definitely one of these conversations that I, I also enjoy because, uh, you know, their mental health do matter. They are the fathers. They are the grandfathers. They are our brothers. They are our uncles. And we want to see them um, succeed. Thank you, Dr. Cayetano. Jessica, you want to interject? Um, yes. So I was actually about to say the exact same thing relating it to, you know, with suicide and the fact that males are more likely to complete than females. I was, as Dr. Caetano was talking, that's exactly what popped into my head. And the fact that, you know, we need to take our, our data and our research into consideration when we, when we, when we create interventions, when we, as she rightly said, we need to create these spaces and just kind of, you know, circling back to adolescence, um, you know, globally, suicide is the fourth leading cause of death amongst 15 to 29 year olds in that age range. In mm -hmm. Latin America and in the Caribbean, it's actually the third leading cause. Um, as I mentioned before, I'm from Guyana and I do work in Guyana. And in the 10 to 24, age range our young people we actually have a very serious problem with suicide amongst people age 10 to 24 our young people suicide is actually the number one cause of death in guyana um and so back to the conversation about creating spaces you know i feel like it's also really important for us to create these spaces where adolescents can 
go for help, that they feel enabled to reach out, um, that we create targeted interventions and programs that speak to adolescents and mental health, not just suicide, as you mentioned, you know, suicide is like the terminal very end of the spectrum. But if we want to talk about promotion and prevention, we need to create that space from the very beginning where adolescents and young people can feel enabled to access services and to mm -hmm. reach out for help. Thank you. Thank you both. So I have another question for you, Jessica. Depression, anxiety, and behavioral disorders are among the leading cause, like you've mentioned, of illness and disability among adolescents in the world. What you meant, you started to mention the situation in Guyana, but what about the situation in the rest of the region? Is there anything, uh, did any other stats come to mind? And what can we do to help with this? Maybe Dr. Cayetano might be better to speak to that. Um, you know, my I don't want to give you stats about the region that I I I am not, you know, able to speak to off the top of my head. Maybe she might be able to jump in here. Not a problem, Dr. Cayetano. Definitely. You need it. Definitely. And you know, from PAHO, as you know, we have a specific unit that looks into this um in, in into um more specifically gen gender role. As you mm -hmm. know, and it's interesting because women, we are mothers, we are we are mothers, we are sisters, and uh, what we want, we, we are we are the one that raised raised our families, you know, raised our children. But you tend to see that men sometimes are socialized to restrain their emotions, not to express their emotions. So men don't seek you know, if you're too emotional, that's not manly. That's not women are the ones that should be expressing these emotions. And these right, kind right. of these kind of things, as you know, do not help in terms of seeking help, right? Because and I think I like that in the conference that we do have a lot, a lot of boys in this conference, a lot of young men, a lot of um, you know, and they're very expressive, uh, and that's very good to see because we want men not to be restraining their emotions. We want them to be able to be more, uh, you know, open or going, engaging in conversation. So, as I mentioned, uh, and this is through the work that I, I was doing with um, or other unit, we had the, we had this report. Um, we, even with Dr. Kaffee was there, Sonja, we had this report on masculinity where I was mentioning to you that the, when you look at the um, life expectancy that women tend to live uh, six years even longer than men. So we, you know, we live longer than men do. And it probably has to do with that, with that behavior. So what, what should we, what it is that we want to be able to see? We want public policies that helps male to see, you know, this, this, these spaces that I was talking to you about, having public po policies to make sure that there's opportunity to seek help, uh, mm -hmm. encouraging preventative measures, you know, like at what age they have to go and seek, do their normal, like, you know, women will tend to go for a preventative care. So we want right, to be able right. to do the same for, for males. Uh, you want to be able to promote positive health practices. How do they engage in these positive health practices? Uh, and um, building building that gender and masculinity for health sectors and but fo and focus a lot on promotion and prevention programs and i don't think we should wait until they're adults i think that's something that has to happen as it, children so that it becomes easier as they grow become boys and men that is easier for them to you know access health care uh, and seek so, seek support like that should be embedded as they're they, they're growing. So I think we definitely are focusing on that. You know, when you come from Pajo, that as mm -hmm. I said, they have there is a report, there is public policies, there is support to countries in how how we make sure we build that. Um, we we build hopefully the culture. You know, is what has to be transformed. You know. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much, Dr. Cayetano and Jessica. So I'd like to now welcome to the panel, Ms. Shonetta Lowe. Uh, Ms. Shonetta, can you hear us? I can. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the show. So can you introduce yourself to our audience? You have 30 seconds. Introduce yourself hey, to our hi. audience. Hi, everyone. I'm Shonetta Lowe. I am an environmentalist. Uh, my area of specialty is water, sustainable development, 
and my work is in uh you know environmental and social community relations uh currently so my focus is to work from the level of the community in order to bring about larger change so uh yes i like to work from the ground up essentially <laughs> Well, thank you and welcome to the show. So, and again, for persons who are just joining the session, <clears throat> we're talking insights from the second Congress on adolescent and youth health in the Caribbean. And so Shanetta, earlier we started to talk about the impact of um, the environment on our mental health. And as you talked about your experience and your work in the environment, tell us, like, what are some of the things that youth can do to innovate, to be innovative and to find sustainable solutions to help the environmental threats we're experiencing in the Caribbean? Thank you very much for that question. You know, um, the entire subject of sustainability is one that we talk about ever so often. In, in most rooms you go to, you hear, oh, sustainability, sustainability. But mm -hmm. what exactly is sustainability? Now, sustainable, sustainability is just the ability to meet our current needs, our present day needs, without compromising the ability of our children and our children's children to meet their own needs. Now, in order to innovate in such a way that we can be able to meet those demands for now and a future generation, that responsibility will rest largely with the youth because we are the ones who are now inheriting that uh, system that our uh, predecessors have left for us. Um, <clears throat> of course, there are, uh, we have a lot of work to do, but I don't think that it uh, should deter us from mm -hmm. getting the job done because innovations can range from uh, technological innovations. They can be uh, lifestyle changes that um, have never been done before but can be posited because sustainability is a lifestyle. Uh, in order to be sustainable, we cannot just talk about, uh, okay, uh, we are gonna just innovate this and do this today. We have to make a conscious decision to determine, uh, to limit our consumption on a daily basis. What are the lifestyle changes that we could do? How do we treat with our waste at the level of the household? Remember, I work from the level of the community, right? So I'm just gonna start from bottom. <laughs> How do we treat with our waste in the household? How do we discard of that on our day to, in our day-to-day -day lives? Are we buying bottled water four or five times a day? Or mm -hmm. are we walking with our reusable water bottles every day? And are we promoting that? Are we normalizing that? And within our workplaces and our spaces, are we um, encouraging persons to go paperless, you know, instead of just uh, giving me a lot of files and reports and storage cabinets and the works, are we suggesting instead, please kindly mail me this document instead? You know, and so, like I said, it's a lifestyle. It's something that we have to be conscious of. And so when we talk about innovations, we can find socially innovative ways to be sustainable and to be environmentally conscious. And that mm -hmm. can start with anyone and it wouldn't cost us a penny. Rather, it's probably going to save us because I'm sure if you count up all the bottles of water that you buy pretty in comparison to your reusable water bottle, you, you're going to save much more. But uh, in addition to that, there uh, is the issue of food security and, you know, youth are now coming up with the advent of vertical farming and these things have been very pertinent to our uh, conservation of land. And now in our engineering, we can now take those concepts and employ them to ensure that uh, food security is improved. And we have our youth who might be more technological, who might decide, you know, okay, uh, we should be considering more greener forms of utilizing energy or energy that requires less fossil dependence on fossil fuel emissions. Mm -hmm. So those are some examples of what those things can look like. But again, uh, it's a lifestyle and we have to learn to walk the walk and talk the talk if we want to be able to cultivate a culture of sustainable development. So what do you think that there is a certain age that we should focus on to help to train them and prepare them, as you talk about, for sustainable lifestyles? Um, <clears throat> uh, yes, because this can start from any age. Uh, 
because of the fact that this is a lifestyle and we are in a position to influence the next generation, I mean, the family is the first institution of learning. Our households are our first institutions of first and major institutions of learning. And if we can start in the households to, uh, you know, employ the correct practices so that our children can see that and emulate that, then we would have a generation who is more conscious and who has been able to learn these concepts, not in a classroom, but from their own families, from their own parents. Mm -hmm. And that would be able to, uh, that would be something that could be carried on for generations to come. And that is exactly where it begins, right in the household, irrespective of age, irrespective of greed, that is where it has to begin. And I think that's very important. What I like about um, the topic from the various panel members here today is that it can all be intertwined. Yes. Because when you think about it, we're learning about the food security and growing our own food. So we're going to eat more healthier foods, which is going to help our bodies in so many different ways and even our mind in so many different levels. And then not only that, we're practicing gardening so it's easy for us, I'm um, sorry, not easy for us, it's helpful for us for doing our mental health exercises to put us, I don't want to say distract, but to put our focus elsewhere, to channel our energies in positive ways. Go ahead, Jessica, I see that you were, you're right on point with that. Go ahead. I mean, yes, I, I definitely agree. You know, we have to channel our energies in positive ways. I, I know, you know, during the pandemic, especially, that was something that, that, I, I myself did, you know, went gardening to channel my energies and that, you know, my mom, she's always like, yes, go outside, get sunshine, go gardening, plant things, talk to nature. And so, you know, that's why I was smiling when you when you just mentioned that. And it's amazing that growing up, we were always outside playing, always. But nowadays, we're always inside on a device. And then, of course, that adds to our, another, our other issues of, you know, non-communicable diseases that we have high in the region. But that's a subject for another day. And again, it, go ahead, ahead. Yeah, but, you know, I'm so glad that you're joining us, Shaneta, definitely, because environment affects our mental health. Definitely. Right. It, our environment is a combination of, you know, our um, physical and, you know, it affects your physical well-being. It affects you, mm -hmm. and it's how you live, mm -hmm. and how you how you work with people, and how are you how you live at home. And uh, not everyone has opportunity to engage in in walking, in running outside. You know, depending on their community, maybe That's it's dangerous. True. Maybe they cannot go out, and we sometimes forget and think that everyone is equal, and that's not the same. Mm -hmm. And similarly, with your work environment, you know, like the social climate. So I think it's so good. I was looking at the agenda for the conference because I'm hoping that people can still join, you know, online, they can still join the conference. And tomorrow, Saturday, as you know, the plenary will be Youth, Climate Change, and Sustainable Development in the Caribbean. So this is to show, Ms. Tanya, our viewers that this, this um, Congress focus on mental health, focus on climate change, you know, all those things that are so relevant to stay well. But I like what you were saying that this conversation is intertwined, you know, because all, all has to do for your well-being. So right. climate change... Um, Sustainable development has a lot to do with your mental well-being. And so it's good mm -hmm. to know that the conference, if they can still connect tomorrow, we will be, um, that's one of the plenary in the morning. And that will be actually followed by a, another conversation that we will have on mental health. So it's the, those are topics that uh, we are clearly addressing. And we are inviting people to be able to, if they cannot come for, for, um, physically, at, uh, you know, they can join us virtually. And we would encourage persons to join the second uh, the second Congress of Adolescent and Youth Health in the Caribbean on YouTube. It's available. Look it, look it up, register, and share the information. You'd be surprised what you learn and how you may be inspired to better help your community. But as we get we begin to conclude today's session, I'll start with you again, Janetta. We talked about the environmental threats and the vulnerability of youth to mental health problems. What is your call to action today? Um, so my call to action is to really have persons take seriously the implications of uh, 
the environment on our mental health and the importance of ensuring that health and well-being is made our priority and to not treat the environment and health and well-being as something that is separate and far apart because it is not and so if we're able to think about this in a more holistic way then i believe that we would be make we would be able to make those connections and prioritize uh safe spaces prioritize uh services that can ensure that we are uh and that services that would ensure that our health and well-being the needs of our health are met and well-being uh today so my call to action for us would be to create those spaces to ensure that that happens because we cannot function and be the best version of ourselves if our mental health and our environment is compromised in any way so yes that is my call thank you jessica what is your call of action today well, my call of action today is for everyone, not just young people, but everyone to play your part in reducing the stigma surrounding mental health, to take action. And I know, you know, someone listening to this might say, I'm just one person. What part do I have to play? What difference can I make? And my answer to that is we all have a part to play somehow. You know, be kind, look out for each other, support each other. There is a saying, be your brother and sister's keeper. We need more of that happening. Support systems are so important for persons who struggle with their mental health. Support systems are important to everybody. Reach out to your loved ones. Let them know you're there for them. Um, to the young people and to everyone, I urge you to educate yourselves more about mental health. We talked about mental health literacy and education is so important. Um, I want to encourage people to be vocal, keep the conversations about mental health going. We talked about how COVID has really um, brought these conversations to the forefront. And so it's really important for us to continue with that momentum and keep the conversations going. Um, I want to encourage our young people to be advocates for mental health. Speak out in your communities and in your countries. Help us to break the barriers that surround mental health. Thank you so much, Jessica. And Dr. Cayetano? Yes, you're muted. I am muted, yes, thank you. Um, you know, I think mental health is critically important for everyone, everywhere. Uh, it's, in, it's an integral part of our general health and our well-being, and it's a basic human right for all people. So having good mental health means that, you know, we are better able to, to connect, to function, to cope, and to thrive, which is what we want. You know, how we experience mental health changes over the course of our lives in response to changing the, you know, in response to, to situations and to stressors. So I think it's important now more than ever that we pay attention to me making these changes to make sure that governments are are prioritizing mental health because failure to do that is failing ourselves. So as I'm so glad to hear that you in the Bahamas, and in, we have about 26 countries, you have some influencers that are joining this campaign to do their share to support mental health. Thank you for, um, for the invitation to be part of this panel. And thank each and every one of you. It's been an informative and educative session and um, we appreciate we appreciate each of you and the work that you're doing. We can encourage you to continue. We need you in our communities and we're going to build a better world because of the role each of you play in it. So again, so we say thank you. And of course, we say thank you to our audience, um, whether you sent your message, you shared the stream, or you just listened in. We thank you for participating today. Thank you, Ar Aransa. And um, yeah, we, we, it was a really informative session, everyone. And we look forward to another session and we uh, hope the continued success of the Caribbean Youth Congress. Hopefully I get to attend one of the sessions soon. I would definitely be excited to do that. And um, again, we say thank you, everyone. And if you have any questions about any public health issue, please feel free to visit our page at www.paho.org. Thank you, everyone, and do enjoy the rest of your weekend.